In the open expanse of the Mexican desert, seven men slowly approach a hidden canyon. They are members of a special search team looking for signs of life, signs of communication from the universe beyond the stars. Mr. Lacombe, do you see what I see? I cannot be sure. Let us get closer. Can it be? Mr. Laughlin, when one is dealing with the unknown, anything is possible. Senor, senor, they are aeroplanes sitting in the middle of the road. Aeroplanes. Look at them, Lacombe. They are old propeller models. Bombers, I think. You are correct, Mr. Lachlan. Torpedo bombers from the Second World War. Get the serial numbers of the engine blocks. Quickly, the members of the expedition record the plane's serial numbers and give them to Claude Lacombe, head of the search team. Here is the list, senor. Do they match? Yes. They seem to be the ones. What one, senor? These serial numbers match the master list I have from the Navy. Then it's true. Yes, David. These planes were last seen 33 years ago. They disappeared while on a training mission from Pensacola, Florida. What happened to the pilot? That, my young friend, is a mystery. In a small house in an Indiana suburb, four-year-old Barry Geiler is tossing and turning in his bed. He might be having a bad dream, Suddenly, a bright red light streaks through his window and wakes him. Pretty light. On the nightstand next to his bed, one of Barry's battery-operated toys suddenly comes on. It is his Frankenstein monster. It raises its hands. What fun! Now, all of Barry's toys are mysteriously in motion. He is very excited. This is the most fun he has ever had. Imagine all of your toys moving by themselves. The light from outside Barry's window is growing stronger. Pretty light! Don't go! Wait for me! Wait! Wait! Barry? Is that you, Barry? Answer, Mama! Barry! Where are you? In a Midwestern air traffic control center, three men are anxiously staring at a green radar screen. They are in touch with a commercial jetliner that appears on their screen. But there is also an image on the screen that they don't recognize. Aries 31, this is air traffic control, Indianapolis Center. Do you read me? I read you loud and clear, control. Do you have it on your scope? I do, 31. Do you have visual contact with the aircraft? He's right on top of me and descending rapidly. 31, you are clear to veer 45 right. Turn it now. That's the brightest set of lights I've ever seen. Can you tell what type of aircraft it is? I've never seen anything like it before. Could it be an Air Force vehicle? Maybe, but I sure doubt it. I think we've got a real UFO. While Air East 31 was reporting its sighting to Indianapolis Center, Roy Neary is at home playing with the electric trains he had set up for his children. Being an electrician for the local utility company, Roy is constantly on call in case of emergencies. It's for you, Roy. I'm coming. Hello. Yes. What's up, Ike? Yes, I'll be right there. Trouble? Blackout at Gilmore. I don't think... No, we're blacked out, too. Hello, Ike. This is Roy. Look, I'm calling on my radio phone. What's the picture? Uh, we're losing power all over the country, Roy. Now, get over to the transformer station, check the lines. I'm counting on you. There should be a crew on its way. Right. What's blacked out? Gilmore, Tolono, and uh, Crystal Lake. As Roy is speeding toward the trouble spot, he keeps his radio tuned to the police frequency. He is surprised to hear a number of calls reporting lights in Tolono. Ike, this is Roy. Are you at the scene yet? No, but listen. The police are reporting bright lights in Tolano. I thought that town was totally blacked out. Well, that's what it shows on my board. I better go and check it out. If we have current in those lines, someone on the repair crew is going to get electrocuted. Roy Neary is concerned over the conflicting reports about the lights in Tolono. 
If they are true, then someone could be seriously injured on the line. With his yellow dome light flashing, Roy maneuvers the company truck down the highway at a frightening 90 miles an hour. Oh no, a child! Mary! <laughs> hey, lady! You shouldn't let your kid out this late and walking on the highway. I've been looking for Barry for hours. He disappeared earlier this evening. I'm sorry, Miss... Jillian. Jillian Guiler. This is my son, Barry. What is that? Where? On the horizon. It's not possible. They're so bright. Cover your eyes. They're flying so low. Get out of the road. Look, I'm going after them. What, Barry? They play nice. Not knowing whether or not to believe his eyes, Roy Neary races across the highway in an attempt to get a second look at the trio of UFOs. Before he knows it, he is crossing the border into Ohio and gaining rapidly on the Indiana State Police cars that had passed him earlier. He can hear the conversation of the two Indiana officers on his two-way radio telephone. I'm going to catch those things, whatever they are. We seem to be gaining on them. Watch the rope. Later, at the Indiana State Police Headquarters... Mr. Neary, do you want to make out a report? I saw them. I know I did. But I don't think it would be wise to write it up, Mr. Neary. What are you saying, officer? It's just that the press may blow this out of proportion. You know, we don't want to end up as the laughing stock of the nation. Roy understood. No one, not even the police, were going to admit what he knew really happened. At four o'clock that morning, Roy arrived home. Where have you been? Ike Harris has been calling all night. You won't believe what I saw tonight. Roy, you're not listening to me. They want to know where you've been. Nobody has been able to get in touch with you. Honey, you won't believe this. Let me sleep. They don't make any noise at all. Uh, there's nothing but air, and, and all of a sudden, whoosh, and then a red whoosh. The department has been trying to reach you. I shut off my radio. But it's your job. But get out of bed. Well, wake up the kids. I'm going to show you. In the still of the early morning darkness, Roy Neary drives his wife and three children out to the field where he saw the bright sky show. What are we doing here, Roy? Tell me what you're waiting for. You'll know when you see them. Come on, I came here with you. Now, please tell me, what did it look like? Uh, kind of like an ice cream cone. An orange ice cream cone in a shell. Like a taco. No, rounder and larger. A and it gave off a kind of neon glow. Roy, if one of those ships came down right now and the door opened, would you go on it? Of course, yes. I'm sorry, honey, but anyone would. Don't you see? I don't see. All I see is that my husband drags us out of the house at four in the morning and stands in the middle of a cornfield waiting for a flying saucer to take him off to Never Never Land. Don't ever try anything like this again. We're your family. It's not normal. Later that morning at the Neary home, Roy is getting ready to shave. He's playing with the shaving cream in his hand, trying to construct a landscape scene. No, I don't think that's right. Ronnie, what does this remind you of? I don't want to talk about it. Last night I saw something I can't explain. Last night you behaved like a I'm moron. going out there tonight, and I'm going to figure out what that mountain is. Your shaving cream mountain? No, you're going to stop playing and come down to Earth. No more nighttime excursions. Okay, I won't. I won't go. Okay, all right, I'll tell him. Roy, that was Grimsby from the department. You've been fired. He didn't even want to talk to you. What are we going to do? This shaving cream just won't stand right. I can't get that mountain into the right shape. Roy, did you hear me? They fired you. There's no more job. No. Let me try to shape it again. Roy went back to the field the next night, and the second night after that. Soon he noticed two familiar faces. Hi. Remember Barry? <laughs> How can I forget? That was some night, wasn't it? It doesn't feel like it's over. You're sunburned. 
The glow got my face and my neck. Did you tell your wife what we saw? Of course. Did she believe you? She understands. <laughs> I know. I called my mother and she said, I've been living alone for too long. Yes, but the fact remains, we saw them. Nothing can change that. In the California desert, near Barstow, the giant parabolic ear of the Goldstone Radio Telescope is listening to the sky. Inside the control bunker, Claude Lacombe and David Laughlin are briefing their staff. Okay, everyone. We have received two 15-minute broadcasts. Like this. What about a response to that? First, we have to figure out what it means. You know, I used to be a cartographer, a map specialist. The signal looks like a number symbolizing longitude. Do you think they are trying to tell us where they are going to land? I'll get a map. Let us see. Maine, South Dakota, Wyoming. Wyoming? In his room, young Barry Geiler is playing with his toy xylophone. The five notes he is tapping out sound strange coming from the poorly tuned instrument. Now the sound of the toy is interrupted by the gentle roll of distant thunder. Lightning cracks around the house. Barry's mother runs into his room. Barry, close your window. Hurry! No, no. Later that day, Roy and Ronnie drive to DAX Air Base to attend a meeting on the UFO sightings. You shouldn't be here, Roy. You don't belong. Shh, honey. These other people, they're all misled. They got him. They did. In the ships. My baby is gone. See, just look at how hysterical that woman is. Her child has been kidnapped. It was in the paper. Jillian Geiler. Yes, that's her. You see what this craziness is doing to people, Roy? Roy? What? <clears throat> uh, folks, if you'd all sit down, please. Now, uh, I'm Major Benchley. In my hand, I have a model of a flying saucer. Made in Japan. <laughs> Major, you can't dismiss the fears that we are living through the first stages of exploration from somewhere else. Look, I'm a reasonable person. All of us are reasonable people. Yet I know I saw something that was unlike anything I have ever seen before. Roy, sit down. You'll attract the TV cameras. I don't care. Major, you people are supposed to run the skies. Surely you can't deny there's been an air show going on. Now, all I can say is that after ten years of investigations, there is no proof of the physical existence of, uh, of these things. What things, Major? Well, please understand, Mr. Neary, I'm not attacking your credibility. Just tell us what's going on. Well, uh, we're not sure. But we can't assume that these were excursion vehicles from another planet. Then what were they? We had some high-altitude refueling missions taking place that night. Also, there's a possibility of a, of a condition called temperature inversion, whereby a cold layer of air is sandwiched between layers of, uh, of warm air. You're not giving us an answer. If there was solid evidence... I am evidence. I want to be taken seriously. In an abandoned warehouse in Huntsville, Texas, the special UFO team under the direction of Claude Lacombe is loading trucks with sophisticated electronic equipment. You should be at the coordinates in Wyoming by the day after tomorrow. Remember, this is top secret. I don't think we'll have any problems. The trucks are well disguised. How will we evacuate the area? The army has seen to that end. A uh, clever plan, no doubt? Yes. Poison gas. Uh. Back at the Neary household. Uh, I'm sorry I exploded at the meeting, Ronnie. I'm so ashamed. Look, I have to go and find out what's driving me so hard. I have to find out. I know. You understand? I'm not sure, but do what you have to. The key is the mountain. I've been trying for days with shaving cream, dirt, whatever I can get my hands on to recreate that image I saw. Somehow I've got to find and it. And here's a late-breaking story from Wyoming. Okay. It's sundown here in the hot zone of Wyoming, and thousands of civilian refugees are fleeing the scene of disaster. No, no, wait! Seven wait. tank cars of G-M nerve gas destined for destruction by the Army overturned a few hours ago at Waukesha Needles Junction. 
There are no towns or settlements here in these wild Wyoming foothills, but vacationers are being evacuated as Army and Marine helicopters search a 100-mile area that has as its center the peak known as Devil's Tower. That's it! That's the mountain! It must be the message. They want me. They want me to know. Look, I've got to call Jillian. I've got to go there. Devil's Tower, Wyoming. That's where I'll find the answer. 